Welcome to Sunrise this morning. Our top story, some breaking news. There's more misery on the high street. More than 2,000 jobs are at risk, with HMV on the brink of collapsing into administration. Sky News reveals that young children and people in their 70s have been hit by police officers firing tasers in the last three years. An investigation gets underway into the deaths of three British tourists after their car plunged off a bridge in Iceland. Jeremy Corbyn calls for MPs to cut short their Christmas break to vote on Theresa May's Brexit plan. From villain to hero, the former inmate and drug user who's helping those in need in his hometown. Very good morning. You're watching Sunrise. Thanks for joining us today. Some breaking news for you. More than 2,000 jobs are at risk at Britain's biggest high street retailer, HMV, which is in danger of collapsing into administration. Our city editor, Mark Kleinman, broke the story for us this morning and is on the line. Mark, tell us a bit more about what's happening. Yeah, that's right, Tom. This will be the second time in six years that HMV has filed for administration, the last time being back in January 2013 when it was bought out of administration by an investment firm called Hilco. Now, as I understand it, trading, uh, particularly in the music area of HMV's high street business, has been so weak in recent months that uh, directors of the company have concluded that it doesn't have a viable future and therefore are likely to make an announcement later today uh, that KPMG has been appointed as administrator to HMV. As you said, this move would threaten more than 2,000 jobs. There are about 2,200 people who work for HMV. It trades from about 130 stores across the UK. It's a much smaller version of the business that was uh, in existence prior to its last collapse into administration. But nevertheless, it is what you might call an iconic name on Britain's high streets. And it's a really important distribution outlet for the major record labels. Now, they, as I understand it, have been in talks in recent days about providing additional financial support to HMV, but those talks have concluded without success. And as a result, the company will fall into administration today. And of course, and this will probably be the first but not last of the major high street retailers to reveal that Christmas trading and the uh, period leading up to it has not been sufficient uh, to mean that there is a viable future. We will expect to hear more in January about chains that have suffered uh, across different high street sectors uh, because of the same cocktail of regulatory costs and changing consumer behaviour that this year saw names like uh, Poundworld, Toys R Us and Macklin become casualties of one of the most brutal high street trading environments for many, many years. As I say, Tom, we should get confirmation that KPMG has been appointed as administrator to HMV, threatening the future of this very famous, nearly century-old British retailing name later on today. Mark, thank you. We'll bring you that news and reaction here on Sky News as we get it. Also this morning, children as young as 13 have been shot by police officers using taser stun guns. A Sky News Freedom of Information request shows that among hundreds of people hit by the 50,000 volt stun gun, there were children, pensioners, including a man aged 77, and dozens of dogs. The police say the decision to use tasers is never taken lightly, but campaign groups want the use of them against children, certainly, to be banned. This guy's Phil Edwards has all the details. Phil, these are pretty shocking statistics. They are, and they've come from, as you say, a freedom of information request, but also the Home Office's own statistics, and they show a marked increase in the number of occasions that tasers have been used on the streets of this country, uh, up from... Um, 17,000 uh, times they were actually drawn uh, by officers, 2,000 times they were actually fired, discharged. That is a rise of 51% on the previous 12 months. We're talking about the year up to April of this year. But it's the age of some of the intended targets uh, that are of interest. They include a 13-year-old boy tasered by officers on Merseyside. There was also a 14-year-old girl threatening to harm herself with a machete who was tasered in Cambria. It's not just the young, it's the elderly as well, a 77-year-old man tasered by the Metropolitan Police in 2016. And other forces to have used tasers against people in their 70s include Kent, Hampshire and the West Midlands. This has obviously been of concern to civil liberties campaigners and we can hear from one now.
police officers need tools, but they also need to use them responsibly because police officers, although they have a very dangerous job, they also have a lot of power, including the power to use force that normal people aren't allowed to use. And so when we see those statistics that show how frequently these weapons are being used and the circumstances, <clears throat> all too frequent circumstances in which they're being used inappropriately, I think we have to ask ourselves whether we've, we're moving too quickly. Now, stun guns have also been used against animals, dogs, on 37 different occasions in the last year, mainly dangerous dogs, and that has been of concern to PETA, the animal welfare group. They say that these things fire 50,000 volts. They're designed to take down adults. They can, and they have indeed proved to be fatal when used against dogs. Now, the National Police Chiefs Council have said the following, the decision to use such force is never taken lightly, and officers always take into account the age of the person. But they also say that in real-life situations out on the street, their officers sometimes have just a split second to make that choice. Do I pull the trigger or don't I? OK, Phil, thank you. In other news today, an investigation has been launched after three Britons, including a young child, died after their vehicle crashed while crossing a bridge in Iceland. Yes, yeah, seven British tourists were travelling in the 4x4 when it crashed into rocks. The other passengers were critically injured. Local media reports say that the people in the car were two British brothers, their wives and children. Sky's James Matthews has this report. First pictures of the crash scene show the wreckage of the jeep beneath the bridge. Driver to lose control. James Matthews, Sky News. Jeremy Corbyn has called on the Prime Minister to bring MPs back early from their Christmas break so that they can vote on a Brexit deal as soon as possible. Well, MPs are due to return to Westminster on the 7th of January, but the Labour leader wants Theresa May to bring that date forward. Well, our political correspondent Laura Bundock joins us now from Westminster. Good morning to you, Laura. Uh, tell us more. Well, Jeremy Corbyn basically says he wants MPs to get that vote on Theresa May's Brexit deal. The deal is voted down, which would, of course, potentially start proceedings towards another general election. OK, Laura, thank you. Newly declassified files released under the 30-year rule reveal the depth of anger in Westminster after the brutal deaths of two undercover soldiers in Northern Ireland. There were calls for troops to be pulled out of Belfast at the time. Let's go to our Ireland correspondent, David Blevins, who is in Belfast for us. Tell us more about that case and what else the files reveal. Well, March 1988 in Belfast was an absolute tinderbox. The murders of the corporals David Howes and Derek Wood came at a particularly tense time, throcities. Uh, but the Americans wrote back, stressing that the president had made a judgment call and took full responsibility for his decision to admit Jerry Adams at that moment in history. David, thank you for telling us about those files. Thousands more prisoners are to have phones installed in their cells as the government attempts to tackle reoffending and violence. 50 jails across England and Wales will have in-cell phones by March 2020 at a cost of £10 million. The measure aims to combat the use of illegal mobile phones and help rehabilitation by enabling prisoners to stay in touch with members of their family. Enabling prisoners to call a, 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 a pre-approved list of numbers, uh, phone calls which are recorded, so if there is anything that happens uh, there, for, you know, if they're misused, uh, we have the evidence. Maintaining uh, those links, and, and these are calls which the prisoner has to pay for as well, uh, I think that is a sensible and pragmatic approach to maintain those family ties to help reduce the risk of reoffending, because of course that's how we can bring down crime. The United States Coast Guard says that the search for a missing British cruise ship entertainer has been suspended. 20-year-old Aaron Ho reportedly went overboard in the early hours of Christmas Day. The Coast Guard says it searched the Atlantic Ocean for more than 80 hours, covering nearly 4,000 square miles. Almost half of smokers don't know that vaping poses a much lower health risk than cigarettes. That's according to Public Health England. To try to encourage smokers to either quit or switch to vaping, they filmed this experiment demonstrating the contrast in the amount of toxic chemicals and tar inhaled by the average smoker in just one month compared with e-cigarettes. Tens of thousands of smokers have successfully used e-cigarettes to quit smoking. And in the context of those potential benefits, you have to put the uh, potential risks in context. We know that e-cigarettes are much less harmful than smoking cigarettes. Some pictures for you from New York City. It turned blue overnight, briefly, 
Uh, this was a transformer exploding at a large electrical plant. Thankfully, no injuries, but this blast in Queens, as you can see, appeared to turn the sky light blue. It also led to power cuts and delayed flights. The light show against that iconic Manhattan skyline causing a stir, of course, on social media pretty much immediately went viral. Some users were saying that they thought they were witnessing an alien invasion. Um, sadly, nothing quite like that, but it is amazing to see. <laughs> yeah, New York always looks incredible, but that uh, even more so. Now, Greater Manchester Police has recorded nearly 1,600 crimes involving coercive and controlling behaviour in the three years since a new law was introduced in 2015. Officers say that the legislation has shed light on a lesser-known side of domestic violence. Well, I'm joined now by Harriet Ristrich, a leading coercive control lawyer. Very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. Um, first of all, if you can just explain what kind of cases you see, uh, you know, w w the people coming to you. OK, well, um, I, I um, work both with victims of um, domestic abuse and other forms of violence against women through the Centre for Women's Justice, um, as well as also with a small number of women who have been driven in extreme circumstances to kill violent abusers in the criminal defence, uh, criminal justice system. Uh, and we have a case uh, of Sally Challen who uh, is arguing that she was driven to kill ultimately because she was subject to, a th in her 30 year marriage, to coercive and controlling behaviour which drove her uh, down to the ground. But um, more generally, obviously that's a very extreme um, circumstance, but more generally, uh, we, I think in the past, uh, in terms of understanding of uh, domestic violence, have understood it, uh, or people think it's to do with somebody getting a black eye or broken arm or something being thumped in some way or other but that is only a tiny element of 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 uh, what can happen in a domestic and abusive relationship and many relationships uh, involve a form of control that that involves all for a whole range of different forms of violence and other forms of control including of course psychological violence sexual violence and uh, in some um, some some uh, abusers are very very deliberate in in terms of the way in which they subordinate somebody in the relationship gradually isolating them from all their friends and family and controlling uh, everything they do and it kind of creeps upon somebody uh, in a relationship in which they initially think that, that the person uh, they're in a relationship with is, is the love of their life or somebody who uh, is, is, is everything to them and gradually uh, it creeps upon them until a point at which they're utterly subordinate and then... Yeah, I suppose um, when people occasionally... think of domestic violence, many people think of physical violence, but, you know, it can also be mental. Exactly. Do you think that this act has any impact in acting as a deterrent? Um, it's it's difficult to tell how um, how how uh, I, I think it's not very widely understood or used uh, as a law in terms of the amount of coercive and controlling behaviour going on, but um, it, it's certainly important that it is now recognised as a criminal offence and that one that that those police officers who are actually trained in it and prosecutors who are trained in it are able to see that just because somebody um, has been thumped. Uh, doesn't mean that there isn't a whole background story going on in the relationship. And uh, they can start trying to identify uh, what the factors are. And also, you know, the more we understand it, and, and uh, some, some of your viewers may recall the, the, the storyline on the Archers a couple of years ago, which portrayed a coercive and controlling behaviour very, very effectively. Mm -hmm. Once people understand the nature of these, um, this controlling behaviour, um, it, 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 it gives the opportunity for uh, intervention to take place to stop so it. So what, what it are the things that people should be looking out for if, you know, they are worried that a family member or a friend could be in, you know, a coercive relationship? Well, uh, certainly if they feel that they are being very isolated and cut off 
from you know that their their uh, their their normally um, outgoing cells is, is, has turned in. If they if they appear depressed or you know frightened or tense and anxious, if they if um, if the if the man in the relationship is usually the man who is who is the controlling side of the the relationship is is commenting always on her weight and and making derogatory mark, remarks in front of her. If she seems to be sort of constantly on eggshells trying to please him. All those sorts of um, signal, signs uh, and behaviours can be signals of a coercive and controlling behaviour. So you're not necessarily looking for physical violence. Obviously, um, when somebody is in that relationship, they may be very frightened to... Uh, they, they may not even recognise it themselves. They may, they may have convinced themselves that this isn't going on. And they may also be, um, you know, ashamed... That they're 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 subordinating. They've they've mm -hmm. been subordinated in that way. So you have to find ways in which to to talk to them. The police should. Um, uh, I, I mean, we found that that often the police are not following through, and and many police aren't yet properly trained in this. And it's very important that um, that uh, the police officers uh, understand uh, how domestic abuse. Uh, can take place and, and the different dynamics and learn to ask questions. And there is a framework uh, uh, of, of um, understanding how um, coercive and controlling behaviour uh, takes its forms. And you can, you know, there's a whole series of different questions you can start asking, uh -huh. uh, right from uh, physical, sexual violence, economic, you know, somebody's finances being controlled. Um, there, there is a, obviously psychological violence. There's the, there is fat shaming, demeaning, okay. you know, demeaning the woman in various ways. All those sorts of things can be part of an overall pattern. You know, one Harriet. thing on its own, uh, you know, may not... Yes. <laughs> I have to leave it there, I'm afraid. We're just running a bit short of time, yeah. but we really do appreciate uh, you sharing your thoughts with us uh, this morning. Thank you. Harriet Westridge. Uh, a bit of sports news coming up next. Here is Jamie to tell us what he's got in store. Thank you, Tom. Good morning again. Goals and reaction to come as West Ham move into the top half of the Premier League. Let's get a check on all the sport now with Jamie. Thank you. Felipe Anderson was stealing all the headlines last night and knocked out of it this morning. But congratulations to Colin Tizard nonetheless. Thanks very much, Jamie. Everyone looked fairly relaxed about it, though. <laughs> Laughter rather than shock. Even though it broke. Yeah. Let's have a quick look at the weather. Here's Naz. Well, for the rest of this year, it's looking pretty mild. It's also looking mostly fine across southern areas. A bit wetter further north, though. Welcome back to Sunrise this morning. Thanks for joining us. The breaking news, just to remind you, more than 2,000 jobs are at risk at Britain's biggest high street music retailer, HMV, which is in danger of collapsing into administration. Sky News has learnt that HMV uh, filed a notice of its intention to appoint administrators last week whilst holding last-ditch talks with suppliers. Industry sources say that the chain has been decimated by the rise of online streaming services. Now, what would tempt you to give up your comfortable office job to scale some of the highest mountains of the world? Sounds like a nightmare for some people. But for our next guest, he couldn't wait to ditch his suit and tie as a tax man for his hiking boots. Mountaineer and author Mick Fowler joins us in the studio now. Thanks for coming in. Uh, very good morning to you. you. It's a bit of a career change, isn't it? Um, well, it wasn't really a change. It was something that I did together with my tax office years. So the, the book that I've just written, you know, No Easy Way, is really about how I organised my life so that I could go on a Himalayan expedition every year. I mean, how did... so work in a tax office for 30 How years. did you organise your life to do those two things? Um, well, with, a, with an awful lot of juggling, to be honest, because, um, you yeah, know, mountaineering, climbing, um, has, is very much a way of life. It's something that I've done since my teenage years, um, and I needed to fund that somehow. And so the funding obviously came from... Um, from working for the tax office. Sure. Um, but also, of course, as life goes on, as family issues take over, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's the wife, the children, the dog. They're all, <laughs> all time-consuming things. <laughs> she is lovely and very understanding. But um, it's basically a matter of compartmentalising things. Um, and so you know, the family would know that for three and a half, four weeks every year, I would, I would be away on a Himalayan expedition. You know, it's a large part of my life. It's a passion. We were looking for unclimbed, challenging, north face of the Eiger type objectives in the Himalaya. And that's, that's specifically what you go for, isn't it? You're not just off to climb Everest as a bucket list thing. You're seeking out 
places where people haven't been before. And absolutely. Like this next one, is that right? That's right. Yeah, my, I mean, my perfect expedition would be to a place where uh, no mountaineers have been to before, no Westerners have been to before, and these places still exist. Um, so how do you find them? With an awful lot of research. Um, and Google Earth of course, has, has made, <laughs> it's things, literally as, it's made things a bit more unethical. Well, no, Google Earth has come on, on stream, if you like, over the last few years. But historically, it's been things like the Alpine Club Library mm -hmm. in London is a, a magnificent resource for researching what's happened before. But to a certain extent, you really have to, to look closely um, at any photograph, if I see a photograph which inspires me of a mountain... Then We're I looking at look some of you it. on the screen at the moment. Oh, there we uh, go, they've just finished. Yeah, yeah. That, but... <laughs> well, I would look into it in more detail, perhaps contact the photographer, find out exactly where it is. There we go. Yeah. Um, and sometimes you do just have to take a chance. But and as I say, there are... Do you get fear hands. when you're up there? Do you get that fear, or is it just adrenaline? Um, well, it's, not, it's neither, really. It, it's enjoyment, because that's what I like doing. Um, and, yeah, I feel... Yeah, obviously sometimes things go a bit wrong, mm. but generally I'm comfortable, relaxed in the mountains, and it's just such yeah, an amazing environment. And I think the photographs you've got on the screen sum that up. Yeah, amazing. When you're up there, there's, there's nobody else around. You're in a place where nobody else has ever been before, on an unclimbed mountain, for example, and you know that around you there are no other mountaineers or even Westerners for 20, 30 miles more than that. There, there are people who do this professionally, obviously, climbers. Mm -hmm. So I'm just wondering, looking at the number of mountains you've climbed, and I've got lists since 1982 that fits on both sides of these pages, <laughs> and you've been voted Mountaineer's Mountaineer by the Observer, you've won the Piole d'Or three times? Yes. Why, why are you not professional? And because I love my family too, is the obvious answer to that in that if I was a professional, I would have to go climbing. Okay. I would have to be away a lot of the time. And I've enjoyed being at home, seeing my children grow up. Um, and I think I've liked the contrast as well. The, the taxman side of me was a valuation side of things. It was quite testing on the brain sometimes. The mountaineering is quite testing physically. Um, they sat in a nice, contrasting, but comfortable way. <laughs> Are your children into it as well? Um, not in the same way as I am, no. No. Um, no. My son, actually, just over the last couple of weeks, has said that he would like to go to the Himalaya. And how do you feel yeah. about that? But not to go climbing. Oh, right. he, wants, he, wants to just, he wants to just go and explore, I think. At the OK, moment. so not... And my daughter, yeah, she's, she's keen on all sorts of outdoor activity. <laughs> so not quite a moral conundrum yet about no. letting them scale mountains by themselves? Uh, no. <laughs> uh, Mick, thank you so much for coming in and speaking to us. Amazing story. Uh, in No Easy Way is your third volume of Climbing Memoirs, and it's out? It, um, yes, it's Excellent. published in October. Mick, thank you for coming in to speak to us. Best of luck as well on the climb. OK, thank you. Thank you. Still to come here on Sunrise, we'll have uh, more, another interview, in fact, Rebecca, from yeah. this woman. <laughs> Welcome back. For years, our next guest harboured a private passion for singing because she was worried about how culture would view her. But Leila Khadam from the United Arab Emirates chose to take to the stage and challenge gender stereotypes through her music. Uh, before we meet her, let's have a listen to some of her work. Delighted to say that Leila joins us here in the studio. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for coming to see us. Uh, let's talk about what we said in the intro there. You, you harboured this desire to sing, but didn't act on it for a long time because of the culture. Tell us more about that. Yeah, unfortunately in the Middle East um, there is still a little bit of a stigma attached to being a female musician. Um, and it's not really, um, it's more of a protective thing. I think parents of Middle Eastern descent like to protect their children and, and it's perceived as kind of a um, profession that's not really respected. Um, unfortunately though, we really need um, more arts uh, in the community uh, as a touch point and also for um, communicating with the, with the West you know this divide is growing uh, is forever growing so it's important as music is a universal language it's not um, encouraged so there isn't a cultivation of uh, music mm. or musicians um, in the Middle East so it took me a lot of guts and courage to go up against those social conventions. How did you start to work your way into the industry if the industry from what you're describing doesn't seem to exist that much? I mean there is an industry uh, I'm an, I, I sing in English so there's an industry for Arab speaking um, musicians over there 
it's still with the with a title of you know being not a good girl um, so I basically overnight decided that you know I can't live this life I'm being stifled and I need to really express myself through my poetry and my music and um, I started to get gigs and there is a, a, a flourishing live music scene in Dubai but it's more the um, community that doesn't perceive a female musician as a good thing you know so that's what I had to go up against and even though my father is Swiss educated and, and global and, and open-minded he was very much against me pursuing new music um, and still or? I mean we're sometimes at loggerheads about it only because he thinks that I have greater potential in other things and also worries that I won't find a husband you know this kind of like regressive ideologies but um, you know of the feminine and there is definitely you know this kind of coming up of, of female designers and artists and and more respect for them in the community I just hope that you know they can drop some of these regressive ideologies so there's more respect for the arts and how do you spoke a little bit there about how interaction with the West how do you think is there a criticism perhaps of the West and how they perceive women Arab women in these countries certainly yeah and that's exactly what I want to defy is that you know um, Middle Eastern women and, and, and oftentimes and this is why I, I wear what I'm wearing today which is designed by a Saudi Arabian designer is the polarities you know we have our modest side and we respect our culture but we also are open and and liberal and free and and opinionated and we have voices and um, however is it not fair to say that you're still living under regimes that don't like you certainly doing that. yeah I'm originally from Iran and and if I go back to Iran and they know that I'm a singer I, I could be punished for that you know and that's so regressive so and what's your message to women who who maybe have your ambition my in message those places? is and and coming from a corporate background and you know being quite happy in in my work um, I was always I had this conflict within me where I knew that I was made to create and write and sing but I felt you know scared of how the community would would perceive me my me my message or my encouragement to them is to go for it because a they're not the ones living your life and right now I'm more content maybe I'm not as comfortable but I'm more content than I've ever been and I feel really proud that I'm I get women contacting me all the time saying you know it's it's inspiring that you've gone up against these conventions and you're sharing your message and encouraging us to do it too. Layla thank you so much for coming in to speak to us this morning appreciate it and uh, very best of luck the track sounds good it's available I'm guessing to stream and everything yes, like that. Yes on all major platforms. Excellent. Thank Layla, you so much thank for you. having me. Appreciate it thanks. Thank you. Uh, that's almost it from us this morning we will can check the weather before we go though here's Naz.